start recording. So there's these two very intelligent people that I was recently introduced to from the Twitterverse. And there's this guy, Kale Zeldin, and he's talking to this other fellow, Larry Chap. Now, Larry Chap is an interesting person. He allegedly works for an openly friendly towards people who live deviant lifestyles company called Word on Fire Media, which is run by Bishop Varen. Now, they wouldn't be Novus Otis unless they were up to shenanigans. So why don't we review a episode they did about 12 days ago entitled uh, They Discuss the Synod and a lot of other stuff. So this first clip is, oh no, a good pope and a real pope is causing people to lose heart and faith. Um, I wonder which pope it could be. And so we're running up across a lot of people that that are not only just deeply confused about what's going on in the church today, what's going on with Pope Francis, what is this synod thing, what are we to think of? They're not only confused about that, but a lot of people, a lot of Catholics are undergoing what can only be described as a kind of crisis of faith. And, and, and there's just no other way to slice it or dice it. There's, there's a crisis. I'm kind of mulling around in my own head right now an article that I want to write, either a blog post or something for one of these journals uh, called Our, Our Demoralized Church. Yeah. Uh, because I do sense there is a decline in vocations worldwide. There is a decline in... Um, and sort of, I think, general Catholic passion, in, at least in the, in the Western world, the United States, and so on. So that... So he says there's this general crisis, this general decline, but then it includes this general decline in passion. Hmm. I don't know about you, but being passionate isn't something that neither of these two people really are, because they're not very Mediterranean. So, like, okay... That's fine. Go see some Italian Catholics. They'll be like, hey, I'm a Catholic. And you're like, whoa, the passion, the faith is alive. Oh. <sighs> so he says there's a general crisis in the faith. And I always have to wonder, okay, what, what gives someone the right to say that there's a general crisis in the faith? And if there is a general crisis in the faith, what is causing this? Let me see. When did it all go bad? After Vatican II, huh? But how he can't say because he's in Nova Soto Catholic, that it's the, the cause of it is Vatican II. So uh, he, he's pretty much hamstrung himself. And we'll get to um, his opinions on things later. Let's go to the next clip. Now the Zeldin fellow is going to say that everything the Pope Francis does is diabolically evil. He just uses different words, but that's essentially what he's going to say. And we need to remember, these two are Nova Sordos. Uh, uh, an ear for discernment in terms of well what actually does does that mean what does he mean and so i think that we have found um at least again from my vantage point that there has been a little bit of um well a lot of mess and 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 not a small amount of ambiguity in terms of what what is being spoken and so therefore you're left with um you know i would say that in in um the preceding papacies where there was um an attempt to use the organs of the church, especially, you know, the documents and cyclicals mm -hmm. and exhortations as a way of clarifying things. Um, I don't think that that is the case here in in this now over decades long papacy. I don't think that the documents actually um, are meant for clarification. I feel like there's something else going on. And so therefore you have to not only read the documents and, and sort of understand what's going on, but I think you have to watch. And I think the iconography of this um, regime, this papacy, is really something you must pay attention to. Now, it is interesting to note, right, this is, um, they're pretty much wanting to discuss the synod. And the big problem with the synod wasn't that the synod was extremely evil. The big problem with the synod, the synod is that it allowed to open the door a little bit more so that evil could happily sit in the room quietly in the corner and everyone was like, no, 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 don't pay attention to the evil in the corner. It was all a big uh, gaslight, essentially, but not a small amount of ambiguity and, quote, I don't think that this is the case here. So they're saying this about the official acts of the papacy, that the papacy isn't used to um, clarify things. It isn't used to guide things. It isn't used to lead things. The, he says, quote, I don't feel the documents are meant for clarification. They're meant for agenda. Yes. 
this is one of these problems that the Novosortos have that they still haven't fi quite figured out how to deal with. <sighs> it's, it's almost as if he's 99% sure Francis isn't the Pope, but he just can't say those words because that's going too far. And we all know, good citizen, citizen, you must never, ever think that Francis is not the Pope. But the reason why I love to play stuff like this is just to give you the raw take. This is what intellectuals are saying publicly about the church they believe to be the indefectible bride of Christ. Oh yes, his papacy, which is the head of the church, isn't being used to guide the church. Well, what's it being used to do? Destroy it? Ah, oh, okay. Oh, by the way, we've got some lovely coffee de vida. Some good sugar. Mmm. And so this next clip, the context is that, or the uh, summary, I guess, Francis has never said anything heretical ever. And if, we, and if you ever think that he has, then you are probably Satan. Then get, get sedivic contism right out of your head. We, we won't even think about it. We can't debunk it, of course, but we won't even think about it. Pay attention to the iconography of this pope more in many ways than what he says. I mean, because he, I, 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 he's not a heretic. I will defend to the hilt. Uh, the fact that he's not a heretic. Uh, and I think that's, he's deliberately avoided saying, <laughs> sort of in teaching, formally heretical. As my wife says, uh, you know, actually the fact that this Pope seems so theologically suspicious uh, only underscores the guarantee of the Holy Spirit that the papacy will not fall into formal heresy. Because well, le left to his own devices, he just might darn well do that. But I think even Pope Francis has a kind of sense of not wanting to cross a certain Rubicon, not wanting to cross a certain boundary. And I don't know what his motivations are, maybe just to avoid schism, you know, a practical prudential judgment. Uh, but, but I'm grateful for the fact that, that he hasn't crossed that. At least that's my assessment. That's my judgment. So, uh, but nevertheless, so I, that's my assessment. That's my judgment. Isn't that wonderful? Um, lay people are allowed to in the Catholic Church say whether or not they think the Pope has crossed the line. And that is how we know whether or not he's the Pope, because lay people say this. Now, um, Larry Chapp here is an actual doctor, in the has a doctorate in theology, so he has no excuse to not know that Vatican II changed some of the essential teachings of the Church. There, this is such a, a grievous issue to these Sadivic, I mean, to these Nova Sotoites, that they end up making really ridiculous and outlandish uh, claims. As we're going to look at, um, this Larry Chap fellow has a, a blog, and we're going to read in the latter half of this episode part of an essay that he writes. But I have to also point out, um, for a theologian to say, at least this is my judgment. Well, what happens if I get a different theologian? What if we, we go get Bro Diamond and we say, Hey, Bro Diamond, are you a theologian? And he's like, Yes, I am a theologian. You're like, Is the Pope Francis a heretic? And he's like, Yes, he's a heretic. Oh, yay, okay. So it just matters who we talk to. This is a terrible, terrible, absolutely terrible way to do theology. Don't do theology that way. So we're going to go to an Ascent to Mount Carmel with their great pay playlist, the, uh, Funny Things Popes Say. In the 28th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, Jesus instructed his apostles, Teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. In the country of Georgia, there are three different rites of Catholics, Latin, Armenian, and Syro-Chaldean. This last group has its roots in Syria and Iraq, where their largest communities reside. In Georgia, there are about 10,000 people belonging to this rite, and the Pope wanted to meet with them to pray for peace in the Middle East. According to Vatican Radio, during this visit, the question of ecumenism and the problems it can pose was another issue discussed by the Pope that had been mentioned earlier by one of the speakers. Pope Francis told his listeners never to argue with their Orthodox friends or neighbors, and especially warned Catholics never to try to convert them. He described proselytism as a big sin against ecumenism and encouraged his audience to be on friendly terms with Orthodox believers to perform works of charity together and never to condemn them or refuse to greet them on account of who they are. But apparently to these uh, two, uh, our two friends here, 
uh, publicly teaching against the Bible is a okay. It's not. It's not heretical. Well, it's only heretical if a trained theologian has decided it's heretical. Okay. So in this next clip, Bergoglio loves heretics. Call. If you recall, on October 17th, he meets um, and has a photo opportunity with the New Ways Ministry folks, and in particular, of course, um, uh, Sister Gramic, um, who um, is, I, I think it's fair to say, uh, a heretic. Uh, and maybe I'm using uh -huh. my language in perfect, but she clearly does not care for the, the, the teachings of the Catholic Church on matters of sexual um, and mor morality and uh, sexual ethics and, 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 and human anthropology. And yet here he is in the midst of the son of said Senate of Synod, sorry, um, uh, staging a very well publicized um, uh -huh. uh, opportunity. Uh, photo opportunity. So, I mean, tell me that. I mean, how is that? Is, yeah. Again, it's not. It's not a word, right? It's not a document that would suggest. But it, it's something, isn't it? It's something that the guy we believe is the infallible head of our church publicly associates himself with the intention to do what. So, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke seventeen, Christ says, "Quote," and he said to his disciples, "It is impossible that scandals should not come." But woe to him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and he cast into the sea. Then he should scandalize one of these little ones. That's Luke 17, 1 to 2. So, um, I don't know, it seems pretty scandals. Aren't, aren't you scandalized, the dear viewer? That the guy that's supposed to be a Catholic is standing next to uh, the enemies of God. I mean, um... <laughs> If I was a Protestant, I would have a field day. Oh my goodness. Right now is probably the best time in the world to be a Protestant. Ugh. So this next clip. Now, instead of talking about heresy, we want to really talk about dissent from the teaching. And don't say the H word. Don't say the H word. It's not very friendly. I think did establish this yeah. is that these moral teachings are in fact infallibly proposed by the ordinary magisterium of the church mm -hmm. there has been no ex cathedra papal definition on any mm -hmm. of these things uh, and so the the 90 you know the the entirety of the catholic moral theological tradition and its authority is going to be grounded in the infallibility and indefectibility of the ordinary magisterium of the church right so in order to accuse her of overt heresy i think one needs to first establish that the church's teaching on homosexuality is a de fide, de, well, not de fide, de, but, but a, an infallible teaching of the ordinary magisterium. Right. I think you can do that. And therefore, right. I think once you do that and establish that, then it would be okay to say Sister Gramic is a heretic. Right. It, uh, it, it, is it really that hard to do? I mean, you just go to Romans. Okay. Just go to Romans. Uh, it's very, very, very clear. So the ordinary magisterial is the authority given also to the Second Vatican Council, which is a contradiction in terms because it's an ecumenical council. We'll just ignore that. But this idea that we have to prove in 2023, we have to prove whether or not the Sixth Commandment means what it's always meant. It's kind of weird. Like, well, we have the Fifth Commandment. You're like, hey, hey, uh, Vatican, um... Does intentionally running someone over with a car constitute a sin against the Fifth Commandment? They're like, oh, we have nothing in the books about specifically running people over with cars. Oh, what was the make and model of the car? Yeah, we don't have that car model. Um, We'll get back to you. It's like, <laughs> I thought this was an abstraction, you know? Like, you know, that shall not take the Lord's name in vain means all types of language that are vain Take, taking the name thereof when applied to the Lord would be sinful. Like, you could do a little bit of tome. Oh, that's right. I forgot. We're with Larry Chapman. We're all about love and feelings. Yes. So, let's get to the next clip, which is 13. That's not 13. It's 20. 12, 38. So, if we call someone evil who is publicly evil, doing evil in such a way that this evil is contrary to the nature of the office, which is protected from that particular evil, then you're in that bag. Yes. We have some good old slander against Sadius, because what would a Novus Ordo lecture or, or conversation be without slandering someone? 
am cautious is because I think it's important for those of us who think like you and I do and others mm -hmm. to differentiate ourselves from the Father Altmans of the church Fair enough. Uh, and, yeah. and, the, and the crazoid tinfoil hat wearing nut jobs of the church who are out mm -hmm. there hurling these constant sede vacantist pieces of nonsense. I do not want to be associated with them. And so I am going to keep my powder dry and I'm going to yeah. use more cautious language. Anyway, go ahead. If you think for yourself and you're not a theologian, you're not allowed to think for yourself unless you have Larry Chap's opinion. And we're going to see... Oh, oh. Oh, I, I shouldn't actually. I, I was going to dock someone who posted a comment in this video because it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> and is the whole reason I'm doing this, but we'll get to that later. Right? So Larry Cham says, because of his insistence that Bergoglio is promoting evil and openly evil groups and neglecting orthodox groups on the same topic. Now, this comes off in a one event. So what, what he had done was um, he had ignored the Christian groups and then looked at the groups um the for the particular sin there's groups that are very liberal and very conservative that try to help you um and bergoglio went with the evil groups and so we have to wonder okay what's the point of purposely snubbing good people and purposely promoting bad people this act gives the signal because it's an official act of the government of the church that the church is pro evil that's the problem and it's not his first time doing this. He's even promoted anti-Catholics to seat of powers in meetings, even pr in publicly uh, pro-abortion people and pro-one world order people, which is against uh, the social teaching of the church. Excuse me. And so I got to wonder if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck and gets eaten like a, by a falcon like a duck does. But he's definitely not a heretic. And, it, and if you say anything about this, like Father James Altman did, where he says, like, 17 true facts that actually happen. Like, Francis hates Catholics and loves Protestants. And then Altman's like, therefore, he's not the Pope because he has a public manifest intention not to be the Pope. And then this guy's like, oh, you're a nutbag. Well, how do you know that he doesn't have a public manifest intention to be the Pope when he's acting in such a way? That if you wanted to have the public manifest intention not to be the Pope, you would do Okay. Well, the church's social teachings and moral teachings are very well laid out with general norms to be followed. And that is the context for this next clip. Silent on this issue for 2,000 years. You know, quite the contrary. You know, this has been very um, firmly established as anything that the church teaches forever. And then and, and then now not. Right. And so, yeah. you know, so 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 he's choosing to have these photo ops with with um, dissenters. Um, and so I ask you, you know, what does that mean? And then I'm going to ask it also, what does it mean that all of these groups, these listening groups were also handpicked? Um, you know, what am I to conclude? Because in my world, Larry, uh -huh. you know, um, of, of schools and school management and all that kind of thing is like, you know, you can do lots of controlling of the narrative if you can control who's at the table. Yeah, isn't that funny that if you just simply pick the people who are going to attend fo official functions, it kind of shapes the way functions work. So if you were intentionally picking people who were intentionally non-fit for those functions, then doesn't that mean that you've essentially, by the fact thereof, as a natural consequence of, meant that it's going to necessarily end a certain way? Like... What am I to conclude about this? So private judgment is okay, though, as long as you're not a sede. Um, let's talk about this in the real world now, and not in the world of, I'm a pseudo-intellectual, and I write stuff, and I'm bald. Um, you're running an ice cream shop, right? And you hire someone who all he does is eat ice cream, and you realize you can't run a successful ice cream shop because you hired someone that, instead of, serving other people ice cream he just sits there and eats it all day you would go out of business now and what happens in the latin church today the fake one in rome is they hire people to destroy it and then everybody wonders hey why it, why is the guy in charge at actively trying to destroy it when he's supposed to be our leader and our the main bulwark against heresy 
It's almost like he acts as if he wasn't the Pope. He was an enemy and he was trying to destroy our, our faith. Maybe we should catch on. It's like, what does Francis have to do? What does Francis have to do to get these two guys? We're only 15 minutes in this conversation. By the way, there's a half an hour chunk in here where they hit everything. And they're like, oh, the 90s with Marcial Marcial and him and going on with Benedict XVI. There's stuff with Ratzinger. There's stuff with Francis. And they're like, yeah, what's up with all these people? All of these last popes. All of them have been absolutely horrible protecting evil people. Oh, well. But they're definitely the Pope. It's, in fact, that's how you know they're the Pope. Because they're protecting evil people and they're still the Pope. That's how you know it. <laughs> yes. As they say, personnel is policy. Absolutely. And and so, as I said in my last, I keep I hate to keep referencing no. my last article. No, it's so okay. It's a different medium, Larry. We're talking about is in there, uh, is, as I said, I'm, I'm really kind of sick and tired of trying to figure out what Pope Francis is all about. Who the heck knows? One day he's saying that the LGBTQ ideology is a form of ideological colonization and he condemns it. And the next breath he's saying, hey, Sister Gramic, James Martin, Cardinal Holerick, you go girls. Bless you your know, work. Uh, Bless yeah, your work. I'm blessing your work, even though you all say well, the church is full of it on these issues. Oh, that's funny. He's, he's, he's actively promoting the enemies of the church and personnel is policy. And his policy is an official act of the church, which is protected by the Holy Spirit if he actually has the faith. Um, huh. By the way, that protection of infallibility doesn't mean that it's like the best way to do things. It just means it's safe to follow. That's what infallibility essentially means. Um... Like, what is there left to say? These two have given the case against the Novus Ordo Church is this. This is literally the case. Why can I visibly see the people who are supposed to be protecting the faith doing the exact opposite? In my last show, I talked, not my last one, it was two ones ago. I talked about how Ratzinger intentionally lied about Fatima. And it's like, well, if Fatima is an approved apparition and someone who's a pope is also the same person who was lying about it before, maybe he's still lying. And can popes lie? This is a serious question that Novus Ordus need to ask themselves. If the pope is capable of lying, has, doesn't that mean he's not the pope? Well, let's continue on with this. So he he someone wrote to me and says, is the Pope bipolar? No, he's not bipolar. I think he's playing a long game and I think you're under something important here. Oh. I don't think he has taught formal heresy, but he has empowered a wing of the church that does teach heresy. And that that is deeply problematic. And, and, and so, as I said in my article, I, I, I can't figure this pope out, but he's elevated all of these dissenters to positions of authority. Therefore, you connect the dots. You do the math. You, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what's going on here. And what's going on here is that what Pope Francis feels like he doesn't want to achieve through papal fiat, where he just comes forward and says, I hereby change all the following doctrines. He doesn't want to do that. He wants it to happen via a kind of ecclesial drift. So when he literally did that in Amoris Letizia, it, it didn't count. When he did that in Traditionis Custodius, it didn't count. When he did that by updating the catechism of the Catholic Church, all of those are fiat. He just updated, oh no, death penalty. We just decided to get rid of death penalty because of human dignity. Yes. That wasn't reading the room. That wasn't understanding what he's up to he literally by fiat has done so much that he's not a pope he does these crazy synods every few years and he purposely dangles in front of the conservatives oh i'm going to bring in the women priests oh here they are and they're like oh read uh, put the lines up for yourself don't be a sadie oh oh man if, if only i had a crystal ball I should go down to the local seer to help me understand who this Pope Francis guy is. Eh? <laughs> 99% of everything they believe the Pope does is wrong. But that 1%, that's, that's the part that's protected by the... Oh, it's protected. It, it means he's still the Pope. It's like, 
Uh, <laughs> I hate to actually use it in your daily life. Like you're working with someone and you're like, oh, he only screws up the orders to this ice cream place uh, 90% of the time, you know, but 10%, he's still good. So he's still, he's still good. Don't run a business that way. We need to recall that Pope Honorius, as uh, Nova Sword of Watches pointed out in the uh, case of Pope Honorius, that um, Pope Honorius was excommunicated because he didn't um, actively use his resources to fight heresy by the Sixth Ecumenical Council. And that was repeated by the Seventh and Eighth Ecumenical Councils purposely affirmed so um there's the precedent in the catholic church goes the other way not in favor of larry tap but against him but you know he's a professional theologian so whatever he says is probably true so in this next clip dr chap is going to tell us just how out of touch the man he believes is the infallible head of his church Take Catholicism to the streets. Right. Status quo right. suburban right. Catholicism That's is right. a dead end. I write exactly. about that all the time. Yeah. I was hopeful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, let's re-weird Christianity. Let's right. re-wild Christianity. Yeah. Let's have some street saints again. No. Apparently what he means is let's just upset all of those backwardist conservative stick-in-the-mud Catholics and let's put into positions of authority all of those Catholics who simply want to bless the secular zeitgeist. That's right. what this synod was about. That's what the Rupnik affair yeah. is about. That's why he drags his feet in all these sexual abuse cases, because in point of fact, he doesn't care. He doesn't care about <laughs> sexual sins, sexual abuse. I'm going to say that bluntly. His track record shows he doesn't care. Yeah. Wow. His track record is he doesn't care. That's a pretty mean thing to say about someone you believe is your infallible head. But, but let's compare that to politics, right? Make it cool to be a Republican or a Democrat. Let's bring federalism to the streets. Let's get the Malays out of the suburban middle class. What, what, everything he said in this video, this uh, Larry Chap fellow, is important. It also needs to be recognized. It's a special charism for a select few to do street preaching. And the vast majority are not called to do this. I really hate this, right? Because I'm an introvert and I hate this idea of I'm going out there in the world to convert people. <laughs> That's for some people. It's not this, oh, we got to get excited, get a movement. And while I'm going to skip over the pretty much... They, they go on for... I watched about another half an hour of this video. And man. Wowzer. There's a lot of bad stuff that's happened in our lifetimes. And, you know, I'd rather just not look at it. So, what I'd rather do is look at a document from the his uh, Gaudium et Spes 22. For, entitled, From the Discaled uh, Lady. He says, Vatican II was a missionary council. Now, I've never heard of anybody ever saying this before. Like, oh, it was a missionary council. The next day, it's going to be a different kind of council. It's a, it's a different council every day. I guess new theologian's job is to make things up as they go. And his next sentence reads, It was not a modernizing or, or liberalizing council, oh, as the popular media tells us. Both then and now, or as he said, yeah, both then and now would have us believe. Now I know that my viewers know that publicly lying about other people is a mortal sin. So let's fact check this with John the 23rd. You know, John the 23rd might have had an opinion on this particular topic. Now, the word modern appears seven times in the opening address to the Second Vatican Council. And John the 23rd is very much about modernizing as he den denigrates the naysayers. Quote, In the daily exercise of our pastoral office, it, it sometimes happens that we hear certain opinions which disturb us, opinions expressed by people who, through fired with commendable zeal for religion, are lacking in sufficient prudence and judgment in their evaluations of events. They say nothing but calamity and disaster in the present world. They say over and over that this modern age of ours, in comparison with past ages, is definitely deteriorating. One would think from their attitude that history, that great teacher life has taught them nothing. 
They seem to do so imagine that in the days of earlier councils, everything was as is, so, is should be so far as doctrine and morality and the church's rightful liberty were concerned. That sounds like he wants to update things. That sounds like a wrong college, John the Twenty Third, really is about let's say a new way to do things. John the Twenty Third continues. We feel that we must disagree with these prophets of doom, who are always forecasting worse disasters as though the end of the world was at hand. But it is equally necessary to keep up to date with the changing conditions of this modern world, of modern living, for these have opened up an entirely new avenues for the Catholic apostolate. So, um, uh, that was 1960s, 1964, I think. Uh, so far, um, the exact opposite of whatever this Larry Tapp guy says is what actually the, the Pope who has started a, the Pope who started a council says don't you love this you just fact check people and then it's the exact opposite well okay you know that's typical for the Nova Soto religion <laughs> and our duty uh, continuing on with the quote and our duty is not to guard this treasure as though it were some museum piece that we are the curators but earnestly and fearlessly to dedicate ourselves to the work that needs to be done in this modern age of ours pursuing the path path with the church has followed for almost 20 centuries. Now you do have to wonder what's the use of putting modern in when you are also in the same breath uh, putting ancient in. Because you could just be like the church is a vital being and you wouldn't have to have either of those terms. It's just, just very strange grammar. Continuing on. Quote, what is needed at the present time is a new enthusiasm. Yes! A new joy. Okay, got that. And serenity of mind. In the unreserved acceptance of all the entire Christian faith. Without forfeiting the accuracy and precision in its presentation which characterizes the, or characterized the preceding councils of Trent and the First Vatican Council. Lip service. <sighs> Lip service. Anyway, continuing on, quote, she believes that present needs are best served by explaining more fully the purport of her doctrines rather than publishing condemnations. Man, there's something I hate. It's all oh, those rigid Catholics and their condemnations. And I've had this conversation with people before, but this one always bothers me the most out of all the things in the Vatican II. Condemnation is the easiest way to teach. Like, don't do this is much easier than go out and play. Like, when you're when you're a kid and you're growing up, your mom's like, go outside and play. What does that mean? That's a huge open bag. That means do everything until you get in trouble for doing something. That's what it means. But if she's like, go out and don't do a huge list, if you're going to sit there and read the list so you can try and figure out how to work around it. Condemnations are really helpful if they're short and to the point and can't trans. In Vatican I, we're like, oh, and you're anathema if you don't believe the Pope has this, this, and this power. Well, if he's not fallible in faith, morals, discipline, law, and government. Okay. Well, that's pretty easy. Okay, I got it. I understand it. Okay. Continue on. Now the need to repudiate and guard against erroneous teaching and dangerous ideologies is less than formerly, but all errors so manifestly contrary to righteousness a rightness and goodness produces such fatal results that our contemporaries show every inclination to condemn it of their own accord. Especially the way of life which repudiates God and his law, which places excessive confidence in technical progress and exclusively material prosperity. It is more and more widely understood that personal dignity and the true revelation of vital importance and our worth every achievement to achieve. Every effort to achieve, every achievement to achieve well. Um, you know, he, he was really going good. He had me. We can't be exclusively about materialism. Yeah, I agree with that. Oh, and then, oh, by the way, um, uh, personal dignity. Yeah, personal dignity in the modern sense only existed in the last 300 years. Okay. It, well, yeah, even less than that, but I mean, it's just modernism. 
here we are assembled in this Vatican Basilica at a turning point in the history of the church. Bam! Wham! 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 Man, Aron Kali is such a rock star. He, he invented rock stardom. A lot of people think like the Beatles did or Led Zeppelin made it. No. John the 23rd, Ron Colley, invented being a rock star. And not even Elvis understood. Elvis was taught by Ron Colley. Sorry. It's just the truth. Quote, for the opening of this council is a new day. Or for with the opening of this council is a new a new day is dawning on the church, bathing her in radiant splendor. Yum. Yet this dawn and the sun in its rising has already set our hearts aglow. All around is the fragrance of holiness and joy. And the American way. So I picked out a few of the op interesting opening lines out of the opening statement from Ron Colley. Um... It's clear that he's a theme of optimism, newness. He's eager to set up the false church and destroy the church of God. So whatever Dr. Chap said after his opening two sentences, which was so wrong, so dumb, that anybody with a brain, cough, cough, avoiding Babylon's Anthony Abate, please grow a brain soon. Uh, anyone with a brain would immediately know that <laughs> this, this Chap guy is, is ridiculous. He's terrible. And he's not a Catholic. But continuing on with Mr. Chat, this effort failed. It failed because the council could not follow up on this call to holiness with concrete directives and pastoral proposes. It all remained vague and open-ended, which allowed the progressive faction of the church making free use of the media to pitch the council as a modernization that sought to conform the church to the world rather than the world to the church. Close quote. This is the everyone was stupid argument. Yay. This is an argument often employed by children who don't want to go to bed, who are trying to explain to their parents that, no, the parents really don't understand. They don't really need to go to bed. That is the level of PhDs in the Novus Ordo Church. And I'm not sure how everyone was stupid is a popular argument because we also covered this with that Nick guy, that nerdy Thomist guy. But it's also very anti-intellectual at the same time. Sacrosanct Concilium clearly called for a relative liturgy that corresponds to the needs and cultures of its people, determined by the local ordinary in union with either a council of bishops or with the Roman pontiff. And we've also seen propositions for a Brazil, um, an Amazonian rite and a Mayan rite. And one of those rites, I think it's the main one, which is like supposed to be a Mexican rite, I think... Um, it, it lacks words of institution altogether. That part isn't even in the Mass. There. Mass. So, um, um, I don't think people understand that Sacrosanctum Concilium is a, an incredibly blasphemous document. Because if you read its text as its um, authoritative interpretation goes, uh, we're in trouble. Yes. Oh. <sighs> Now, you can always have the argument that there are more than one interpretations to any of the documents of the Second Vatican Council, and I agree with that. There are more than one interpretations of the Second Vatican Council. That's the problem. It's not that there's an orthodox and a non-orthodox. It's that if you put two things next to each other, one's evil and one's good, the evil thing will corrupt the good thing. So the next big quote. The council, therefore, like all councils, had its imperfections, which were all rooted, as I have said before, in a double, in a, in a double naivete, namely a naivete, with regard to the strength of the church's faith life, and a naivete with the alleged goodwill of secular culture to engage with the church in dialogue. What is he drinking? America has always been a pro-Protestant country. He lives in a pro-Protestant country. There has never been a time, except maybe in the 19, end of the 1940s, beginning 1950s, where the Catholics were more united than the Protestants and held more of a political sway than the Protestants. Like, it's, it's just always been. The whole heartland of the country is called the Bible Belt because they're Protestant majority. Like, 
We, we thought that if we were nice to people, then everybody would just love us. Oh, and then they didn't. That's why the council failed. Oh, it wasn't our fault. Uh -huh. <laughs> I guess this whole ecumenical council thing also never got them. It's an infallible council. So, so, see, the way it works is all the bishops get together with some theologians and they say, these are the, the things that we need to correct. And then these are the anathemas which we condemn. Then they send it to the Pope, and the Pope signs it, and that's infallible. It's protected by the Holy Spirit according, according to not only tradition, but the Bible of Matthew 16, 18. So um, the indefectible bride of Christ produced a council, and the council had its imperfections. I need to underline bold this. Um, the council, therefore, the council, therefore, like all councils, had its imperfections in a double naivete. Well, um, Mr. Chap, we'd like to call you up for heresy. Yes, a Holy Spirit protected council was so naive that it was um, fallible. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they always go with saying, like, oh, nice or something, but they're confusing the council with the effects of the council. See, he's saying the council itself had imperfections, not the effects of the council. And when you don't make that distinction, man, you're like Michael Lofton. Ciccolini here may talk like an idiot and look like an idiot, but don't let that fool you. He really is an idiot. So Dr. Chap spreads the narrative that everyone in the council before Vatican II was losing their faith and the whole world was going to hell. And so it really wasn't the council's fault. And my comment is, did you think that two world wars, a total takeover by the world by a single set of rulers, somehow wouldn't rot away the world? Why do you think the idea of a Second Vatican Council was even put forth by um, some or, or documents were being written under Pius XII for an ecumenical council? It's like, hey, look, we just went through a huge European genocide two times in... 30 years. Wow. Hey, maybe there's something wrong with the world. Oh my goodness. Something's wrong with the world. You mean Europeans committing mass genocide uh, within less than 30 years of each other? Yeah, because it's 1419 to 39 to 40, 48 or something, 47, 45, depending where you're at. Yeah. Okay. So Chap says, going along, quote, but when the broader non-Catholic culture looks through our windows and sees us hurling furniture at each other over whether or not the priest should face the people or the tabernacle during the Mass, or if we should pray in Latin or vernacular, and the response we got and the response has got to be some sort of Are you kidding me, right? Do you realize or you do realize, of course, that this world is burning down around you? Some of us look for the to the church for hope. Is this the best you can do? That, that's how Chap imagines Protestants. Most Protestants are like, yes, they're fighting, yes. That means we're better than them, yes. That's what Protestants actually do in real life. Okay, They're not like, the Catholics aren't here to help us. So the issue that I was coming across when I was reading mm, Chap Chaps, <laughs> How do you not change your last name if your last name is Chap? That's incra crazy. Oh, it's spelled with two P's, though. Hey, Chap, I wasn't talking to you. And he's like, oh. Hey, fellow. And he's like, huh? <laughs> um, anyway, um, Dr. Chap clearly believes the Novus Ordo Mise is bad and needs to be reworked. That enough is enough, alone is enough for state of Vicantism. Oh, but, you know. We can't use our brains. Only brains that say Francis is the Pope. And I need to get paid for being a bad theologian. Yes. Um, but that means that the church is not perfect in her sacraments. Which means it's not the indefectible church that um, Pius XII speaks about in Mysticis Corporis. There is only the rad trad bogus ordoists who are real Catholics, therefore. Now that's another huge problem. That's a third way that he's incorrect and heretical because Vatican II states explicitly 
that uh, there's salvation outside the visible bonds of the church, and the Sadies are outside the visible bonds of the church. So whether or not the Sadies are saved, if Vatican II is the real church, is um, very much open for debate. And from what I've seen, I think it actually goes in favor of the Sadies. Sorry. <laughs> And then, D, all forms of criticism of form and matter don't really matter to him, so he threw out also sacramental theology, heresy number four. Then he ends with an idol of not the Pope, but his own will to power. So in one document, um, Dr. Chap not only rewrites history, he commits anywhere from four to five heresies, but at the end he, he espouses some strange Nietzschean um, philosophy. It's very weird. So to him, everything is a semantic. Everything is a word game, which is actually part of the Nietzschean um, idea. Nietzsche, when he was studying, was a, philolo a philologist. That was, he studied the um, origin of words. And he did not believe words were real things corresponding really to reality. They believe, he believed that it was an imposition of the will onto reality that made this all real. And so this is why he's... Um, Dr. Chap is very Nietzschean. Nietzschean, 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 I think. Um, because he indulges in this self, this self um, aggrandizing and self confirming intellectualism. As if because he's agreed with himself, therefore he's proven his point. So Dr. Chap presents us with what he believes the church is as a sinner, or as the sinner tries to return to it. Quote, but when they turn to the church like a ship in a storm, desperately seeking out the old lighthouse that has saved so many before, what they find is that the lighthouse has gone dark since the caretakers are in jail, uh, or are over at the corner bar arguing about altar rails and praising the term subsists in, in a Latin document that nobody reads. Let's stop right there. Um, the Sades read that part in Lumen Gentium 8. Where it says the, the Church of Christ subsists in the Latin Church. We read that all the time because that is like the huge red flag for us. And now he's like, well, well, no one reads it. No, no, no one's ever read it before in their life. Isn't that convenient now? For the sake of my argument, I'm going to say everybody else who um, would debunk my argument by actually reading the Second Vatican Council, oh, well, they don't exist. Continuing on with the quote, or the in-house nature of our degraded discourse is a failure of our missionary vocation, no matter how important such debates are in an absolute sense. So no matter how important the debates are in an absolute sense, it really doesn't matter because we're not being missionary. So the, the mass, even though it's absolutely important, it's not absolutely important at the same time unless we're also absolutely doing this missionary vocation while we're doing this absolutely perfect mass. Uh, the church he wants to create in his mind is very strange. Does Dr. Chap believe no man has ever sinned before the 20th century and that only now when our private sins are broadcast over the internet that sins really matter? It's almost like that. It's it's this weird sort of... um. I, I don't... Wait, why don't I even have earbuds on right now? I'm not listening to anything, and there's nothing else to listen to in this video. <laughs> um, it's it's insane. I don't I, I don't even know why he's like... He's crabbing these people. They argue, and their arguing makes me unhappy when they could be outside doing some good. Mm. Excuse me? Maybe we don't want to go outside to do some good until we have our own house in order. Maybe that's a better idea. So he says, in the, uh, going on a little further down, quote, The rot that we see, both in the clergy and the laity, and myself included, okay, has robbed us of the joy of the gospel. <gasps> the joy of the gospel, that's where everything is. <gasps> and has doused the flames of our passion to share it. Can we say that the liturgical debates are really about the best way to spread that joy? But if that is so, why are the debaters on both sides so joyless in their denunciations? 
Well, how about that, Sadies? Why aren't you happy? If you're not happy while you debate, therefore your debate is wrong. Is this man a literal woman? Is he role-playing as a man and is actually a woman? This is the dumbest argument. This guy's a doctor, by the way. He's Dr. Larry Chap. He teaches at university. Arguments are important, but if you say it mean to me... And by the way, I'm going to link this article so you can go read this if you want to fact check Sede Picante. But believe me, copy and pasting is about as much of work as I actually do. <laughs> Continue on. Therefore, in my view, the debates over liturgy are no longer a sign of the healthy church concerned over matters relating to its core. Let's dwell on that. Therefore, in my view... The debates over the liturgy are no longer a sign of a healthy church concerned over matters relating to its core. Isn't the liturgy the core? He says elsewhere in his article, of course the Eucharist is the source and the summit. But but arguing about the source and the summit, well, that's wrong. Well, uh, heads you win, tails he wins. I mean, as it's, it's heads he wins, tails he wins, it's... No matter what the outcome is, whatever he says is the only thing that's right. But our, uh, continuing on with the quote, quote, but are rather an eruption into a full view of a kind of ideological, political maneuverings that are the inevitable byproduct of a lack of a broader evangelical vision. So, because we're not Protestants, um, therefore, um... We're wrong. We're just wrong because we're not Protestants. That's the only thing I'm getting out of this. Because we don't like, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That, therefore, therefore, our liturgies are all wrong. And even if you have a good liturgy, it's wrong because the people aren't like dancing. If, if they're not dancing like on the Blues Brothers, then there, there's no reason. Not only is El Chapo an evil, <laughs> um, um, but he also doesn't understand liturgy or people with testosterone who like to argue. El Chapo's r argument is, oh no, mommy and daddy are fighting over what prayers to say tonight because they didn't perfectly agree. That must mean the whole family is going to die. Well, why wouldn't we fight over this? We fight over what to eat, we all fight over where to go, what to watch, what to wear. But no, no, when it comes to liturgy, we're all angels. Oh, we, we've never ever fought before in liturgy in the entire Catholic Church. Um, this man is like living in a different universe. Like go to anywhere, any place in the universe where there's option A and option B, there will be a fight. And the Novus Ordo religion has option all the way down Let's see, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. A, B, C, D, E, F. No, it's, it's option F. <sighs> F with five. Because that's how five works in English. It's not with the thumb. That's weird European stuff. Don't do that European stuff. Anyway, I'm continuing on with the article. Where a living and vibrant faith is ascent or is absent, the sacraments lose the fire in their equations and degenerate quickly into ritualized enactments of entrenched political enchantments. So just in case you thought I was like playing it up like, hey, hey guys, I'm Sadie Picante. I make personal remarks about people all the day long, which I do. But um, um, it's really just not that bad. No, this guy is so far down drinking the Kool-Aid that he's made for himself. He's gotten drunk on his own stuff. The sacraments don't work unless you're like, oh, oh man, I feel the faith. I feel it. Um, I don't think that's how it works. Like, uh, and I guess as soon as mommy and daddy fight, everyone just becomes an atheist. Oh, they, they don't have a perfect life. Most parents don't have a perfect life cause, because it's really hard to be a really good parent. Which is why I don't like to touch on the subject because it's actually difficult. It's actually a technical subject. But Dr. Chap believes himself that 
and it's so specific and applies so little to the real world that he might as well have just continued to tell him that all his own arguments in the bathroom. He must have just sit there in the bathroom, look at the mirror, talk to himself, and leave us all alone. But oh no, the internet gives him a platform. So St. Alphonsus uh, Maria Liguri said, It should be known that baptism is not, is not only the first, but also the most necessary of all the sacraments. Without baptism, no one can enter heaven. But I guess, like, when you really don't feel baptism, like, it just isn't baptism anymore. That's what Dr. Chap told me, and it's like, you know, you just get unbaptized if you don't feel that it's really working. Like, if you don't have the, the fire in yourself. Like, now, Dr. Chap means the Mass, but he said the sacraments, right? He said the, the sacraments lose the fire in their equations. So yes, baptism just lost its fire. Baptism is no longer an indelible mark on the soul. This guy's a PhD in theology. Yep, yep, this is what PhDs in theology do. Spread heresy. So, uh, as we continue the article, which I find to be much more enjoyable than listening to him. Uh, <laughs> oh man, I get really annoyed at people when I write up all my notes, right? Then this effeminate sissy really perks this effeminate sissy side really perks up as he looks at himself writing this essay in the bathroom and speaking each sentence to himself in the three mirrors which line his bathing facilities. I get hate from traditionalists. Wah! I get 300 messages. Wah! Being attacked every time I attack traditional Catholicism. What a big baby. By the way, he actually said, um... I get hate mail from traditionalists. He said that in this article. A grown man with a PhD said, <laughs> I write articles and nobody needs to read them, but then they do read them, and then they say my articles are stupid. And then I'm offended. <laughs> Every time I write something against traditionalists. Let me rephrase that. Every time I blaspheme the Catholic faith, I get 300 messages attacking me. Oh, what a big baby. So he says, going back to his article, the prayer, Jesus is Lord, was a dangerous and subversive way of saying Caesar isn't. People were drawn to the new faith of the Christians because they not only preached a message of liberation. Liberation from what? We don't know. Because, you know, actually, um giving you context for what he's talking about. We don't know. Like, liberation theology? Prosperity gospel? What is he talking about? We don't know. He, did, he doesn't know either. He, uh, putting two brain cells together, to him, is a very big accomplishment. Probably left as long with all his hair. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. <laughs> but also lived in a manner characterized by the deep holiness of a charity that was concretely manifested. The book, the book of Acts shows us an early Christian community that shared all goods in common, placing the needs of the whole over the pecuniary largesse of the few. I would like to notice one thing, though. He actually has good grammar. He has every, he, every once in a while, I think it was two different words that I wasn't quite sure what they meant. And that's always exciting to know that some people have a not grammar, it's vocabulary. He has a good vocabulary. Well, but I don't know about you, but um, so there's this little book called the Bible, and it actually says the exact opposite of what he just said. You see, what he just said is saying, Jesus is Lord, is saying, literally saying that Caesar isn't Lord. That's not what the Bible says. So in Romans 13, it says, quote, let every soul be subject to higher powers, for there is no power but from God, and those that are are ordained of God. Therefore he that resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist purchase themselves to damnation. For princes are not a terror to good work, but to evil. And w wilt thou then be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to thee for good. 
if thou wilt do that which is evil which is evil fear, for he beareth the sword not in vain, for he is God's minister and an avenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth or doth evil. No, the princes, uh, uh, the princes are not a terror to the good work. No. But if you do evil in the world, your punishment will either be from the princes of the world or from God, and and from God eventually anyway. So it seems that um no um. The power that's in the world is, is um, allowed to exist there by God. So, sorry, Dr. Chap, but maybe you should uh, learn some theology. So to Dr. Chap, the entirety of the Catholic enterprise is just a natural and whatever suits him today ideology. There is no objective truth, just a cool hierarchical structure. All right. And of course, if you disagree with him, the biggest evidence for his position as being entirely true is that he experienced it. These eyes don't lie. If you feel God is there, then God is there. Okay, that, that's it. That typical of people who cannot abstract, they can only feel. Yes. Dr. Chap. Uh, okay, so he tells this story in this article. And it's so embarrassing. You just want to die. By the way, he wants to die in his own story too. So he relates a story of himself being ashamed. Because he doesn't like... Pentecostalism and praise and worship and he rebukes himself as being an elitist wit because flailing your arms about with mixing genders is a normal way for the church's um, liturgical practices even though it was only started uh, you know in the church 60 years ago after Vatican II or in select places and whenever that showed up in history it was condemned Oh well. So, quote, stayed for two hours that night, shared some punch and cookies. After it was over and made new Christian friends, I will never forget. Never once did I stop and say to myself, too bad this wasn't in Latin. You got high. Like, I really have to wonder about these people. They're like, oh, I had this great religious experience. Have you ever... Can you go back to when you first discovered caffeine and it would give you a buzz? Can you discover when you first were allowed to eat as much ice cream as you wanted? Like, I don't get these people. They're like, I'm supposed to be an intellectual. I'm supposed to be smart. This Dr. Chap is a goof. He's a joke. He is, in fact, a heretic, part of a heretic church, and he defends a heretical man in white that he believes is a pope. You see, children, ladies and gentlemen, friends of the Sadie Picante ch channel, don't believe yourself until you've proven yourself to yourself before you go around publicly saying that you're right. Otherwise, you might get 300 messages telling you you're an idiot and then you're going to cry about it on the internet and try to find someone to console you. But they're only professional theologians and men who are doing this. Yes, that is what real Novus Ordo men sound like. Thank you so much for watching this episode. I hope you got something out of it. Other than this, like, this Larry Chap guy is completely and entirely insane. We should pray for his soul. Maybe he still has a chance to get to heaven. Thank you so much for watching. And if you made it this far, remember you are in my prayers. Bye.